Okay, hello everybody. Let's take a look at section 29G, which is called the normal distribution. Now the normal distribution is going to be slightly different from what we've been dealing with before, because this is really going to be the first time that we're dealing with what is going to be considered a cons continuous random variable. So notice before, we've always been dealing with the discrete random variable, but now we're going to be moving to the continuous random variable. And the nice thing about this though is you'll see that there's a lot of similarities between the two because the principles are the same. It's just that we're dealing with a different type of random variable. Now let's go ahead, we've already seen this before. This is basically the bell curve. So I did my best to draw what would be considered a pretty nice bell curve. So we have this bell-shaped curve here, has the hump, here's your mean, those are the values of x, and here's the probabilities of x. Now, let's just make sure that we go over some of the very key characteristics of this curve before we go any further and talking about how to calculate some of the probabilities of the normal distribution. Some key characteristics here. Okay, number one, notice that it is going to be symmetrical about x is equal to the mean. So we said that if we take a look at the x equals to the mean, which is right here, then this part here is going to be a mirror reflection of this part here, or vice versa. Okay? So this line here, x is equal to the mean, will be acting like a mirror line. Okay? Let's also take a look at this. It says, as x approaches positive or negative infinity. So in other words, as x goes further and further and further out that way, or as x goes further and further and further out this way, the curve gets closer and closer and closer to y is equal to zero, which is the x-axis. Now, does it ever touch the x-axis? The answer is no. But it is going to be a get closer and closer and closer. And, and basically what you can say is that the x-axis will be a horizontal asymptote of the curve. Okay? Now, number three, if you recall with all of our discrete random variables, we said that if you add all the probabilities, you come up with a value of 1. It's going to be exactly the same for this, even though it is a continuous random variable. We know that the area under this curve here is going to be equal to 1. Okay? And that makes sense, for the same reason that this made sense for the discrete, for the discrete case. Okay? And remember that we said was that the points of inflection of the curve establish where the first standard deviations are. So in other words, if we go ahead and take a look at this curve here, where is our point of inflection? I would say that our point of inflection is right about there. So that means that if I go down here, then this means that this is one standard deviation away. And of course, being that it's symmetrical, this would also be a minus one standard, devi a one standard deviation away from the mean, but of course, in a subtraction in, in the negative direction. Okay, so also remember that what we said, uh, let me go ahead and put the other point of inflection there. Remember other things that we said, and this is already something that you know. We said that if we were to go ahead and take a look at the probabilities associated with, uh, for values of x that are between one standard deviation to the left of the mean and one standard deviation to the right of the mean, if you add those percentages up, you come up with 68.26%. We also said that if you go out two standard deviations away from the mean, so if that was one, then that has to be where two is. This is two standard deviations away. Uh, this would have to be two standard deviations away. And if I was to go ahead and talk about the probabilities from two standard deviations away from either side of the mean, the area that would be contained from here all the way to here would be 95.4% of your probabilities. And if we go to even three standard deviations, well, I'm not going to draw three standard deviations because we're going to go a little bit further there, you're going to come up with 99.7% of your information. So nothing different here. This is more or less some of the things that we want to keep in mind that we've already uh, investigated in previous chapters. Now the most important thing that we're going to have to do for section 29G is you're going to have to calculate probabilities based upon the normal distribution curve. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example here. Let's assume 
that our mean is 50. So let's say that this is 50. And let's say, for example, that our standard deviation is 4. So that means that this value right over here has to be 4 over, so that's going to be 54. This is going to be 58. This is going to be minus 4, right? So that's going to be 46. That's minus 4, so that's going to be 42. So those would be the values that you would come up with for this particular uh, normal distribution. And that's what the curve would look like. Now before, when we actually uh, investigated this for the first time, we always talked about probabilities which landed on these numbers here. Okay? But in this chapter, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate how to find the probabilities if they do not land, or if they do land on, those on these particular green values. So let's just say, for example, that we wanted to calculate the probability that x is going to be less than 45. So if I take a look at 45, 45 is about here. And if I was to go ahead and shade that area, that area would all, all of this part right over here would be shaded. Anything that is less than the value of x being 45, we want to include all of those probabilities. Okay? And that would be represented by that shaded part that we would draw. That we would draw. Now, I went ahead and calculated it already. It is 0 0.10564983. That's as far as my calculator could go. Now, how do you go about calculating that? The way that you calculate that on your calculator is by doing this. It's a normal CDF. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to go 10, oh, sorry, negative 10. negative 10 to the 10 power, comma, 45, comma, 50, comma, 4. Now, if you go ahead and put this into your calculator, you're come on, going to come up with exactly that value. It's going, to be exact, it's going to be similar in that regard for here as well, in the sense that we would do the normal CDF, in this case, it's a little bit different though, because when we actually look at what the problem is asking for, it's asking for the probabilities of all x values greater than or equal to 51. Well, 51 is about here. If I take 51 here, and I shade all of the area that goes this way, how much area is that? Well, I have to do this for this particular problem here. It would be 51, comma 10, so the 10, comma 50, comma 4. Okay? And if you did that, you would come up with this particular value there. Now, how would I do this one? This one here looks like this. Okay, now I'm going from 45, which is about here, to 51, which is about here. So I'm talking about all the area that would be contained within those two values. So this is how you would put it into your calculator to come up with that value. Okay, and there you go. That's how you would calculate those values. So I'm hoping that you actually see a pattern here with how we can do this. In general, when you go to this function on your calculator, what does this number actually represent? That number actually represents the lower bound. In other words, what's the lowest value of x for your calculation? This is the lower bound. What does this second number represent? That second number represents the upper bound. What does the 50 represent? Well, of course, the 50 is the mean. And what does the 4 represent? The 4 represents the standard deviation. Okay, so now you know how to go about calculating any particular probabilities for the normal distribution using your calculator. The key is, is when you actually do the IB exam, there's going to be times when you're not going to, there, there's going to be a paper where you cannot use your calculator. So the question is, is how do you go about actually calculating these values? We'll talk about that in class. That would be easier to actually explain uh, together.
Okay? But for the time being, you now know how to calculate any probability of the normal distribution curve using your calculator and based upon these key characteristics of the bell curve. Okay? All right. Good luck and see you in class tomorrow. Maybe not tomorrow.